This, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Well, hello and welcome to the Jay Allen Show. We are coming to you live from the Safety FM studios in Orlando, Florida. Well, 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 hopefully your week is off to a great start as this world of ours keeps on changing and changing as we move forward. Well, let's get you started with what's going on today, because I think that this is going to be an important conversation. Well, last week, if you did hang out with us, I was actually hosting an event known as Safety Day 2020 with the ACFS. If you did hang out with us during the event, we were coming to you from the back lot at Universal Studios in Orlando. Well, as I always tell people, we tend to do things, you know, above and beyond a little bit more than what's expected. So we actually had another segment that was available about leadership. Now, during the event that we were doing for Safety Day, we never got that out there. But I thought that this might be the perfect medium for us to have that conversation here today. So today on the show, I get to sit down with Richard Nichols. He is the sales and marketing director for SG World. And he talks about his version of leadership and how he sees it. And also as part of the conversation, we have Joshua Caudell. He is the president of Safety Leadership Innovators and also the president of the ACFS. So let me not waste too much of your time and let's get you started right now with this conversation with Rich and Joshua here on the Jay Allen Show. So currently we have just finished actually doing Safety Day 2020 where we were streaming live at the back lot at Universal Studios in Orlando. So as we always know, we prepare or over prepare for some things sometimes. So let's just be realistic. But we had a whole speech or conversation ready about leadership and we didn't get to it. And I still think that this is something that's very valid and that we need to have a discussion about. So I have Josh here and I have Rich here with me as well as we're going to go through this discussion. And we're just going to talk very briefly about leadership because I think that it's sometimes that it's something that's overlooked. And you guys being involved with the ACFS for a period of time. I would definitely like to have a better understanding of, number one, your businesses, that's for sure. And then number two, have an understanding on how do you actually present leadership with the different companies that you get to interact with. Absolutely. Maybe I'll start. Is that okay? Yeah, please do. So, uh, I and, and Josh, if you don't mind, if you can tell people about yourself a little bit, just in case where they can picture the voice at first, if, they, if they're not getting the video feed, Absolutely. that's for sure. So Josh Caudill, I'm the owner of Safety Leadership Innovators. Uh, we started this company because of leadership, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. We feel that we've got a great message to communicate, um, and we feel like we do that eloquently, and we do it with a lot of grace and dignity. Um, far too often, people don't like being told what to do or how to get to wherever they want to go. So our philosophy is ignite the journey. So at SLI, we ignite the journey no matter where you're at in that journey, realizing that different organizations and different people are in different places in their journey in life. So what we try to do is develop a plan with those with those organizations or people to get them to where their vision wants them to be. Uh, we provide resources like training. We do a lot of leadership development training, a lot of safety resources, but we look at it from a health and safety perspective. So we believe firmly that if an, if an employee or an individual is healthy, mind, body, and soul, they will perform safely and they will per- perform more efficiently for their organization. Rich, how about you? Uh, well, from uh, my name is Richard Nichols. I'm the Global Sales and Marketing Director for a company called SG World. And day to day, I look after SG World USA. I guess for us, um, you know, there's a couple of things. We have a purpose statement in our business, which is helping you make a difference. And that's the way that we approach the marketplace. We have 20,000 customers. The business is 51 years old. Um, but that, that's also about our people. Right. We try and understand why our people come to work every day, um, but also, uh, you know, what are their aspirations in life? And we try and give them the support to achieve that. And that's underpinned by our four family values, which are do the right thing, do it in the right way, be the best you can be and be fresh as well. And because of that, we enjoy, you know, time serve people. I think 
30% of our people have worked for our company for 20 years. And that's very much because we put our people first. And like you say, you know, if we can create an environment where people are engaged and they want to come to work every day, then that's going to reflect in the way that we look after our customers. Uh, and I think that's the biggest contributing factor of why the business um, has been going for 51 years and hopefully another 51 years to come as well. Well, I, I didn't realize that you're already that old, that it's been 51 years. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> but all, all joking aside, when you take a look at this, because of some of the background and whoever wants to actually take it going forward, how do you look at leadership as you walk into an organization? Do organizations contact you because there's already a problem? Or do you look at it and go, maybe there is a problem with the leadership? And I know that this could be one of those questionable questions as, you, as we go through it because it's like, oh, crap, now you're asking me to talk about my customers, but just your perspective on how you see it. Absolutely. So generally when we get a call, it's uh, for a finite problem, right? So people want us to come in and help with something. And what we try to encourage them to do is to come up with a solution and a mission and a journey that aligns with an infinite solution um, that, that engages people across all levels. Uh, a lot of people don't want to be told, hey, you've got a leadership problem in your organization. <laughs> Probably not something smart for me to tell a, a prospective client. Especially if it's the uh, leadership that hired you, I would imagine. Absolutely. <laughs> but um, we believe in self, uh, self-leadership. We believe in um, servant leadership. So uh, our philosophy is the rising tide should rise all, all boats. It shouldn't just be one person succeeding while others are in despair. So if you can coach people and teach people to um, understand that if other people around them are successful, they too will be successful. It takes away a little bit of the competition that, that sometimes deteriorates culture within a company. It's funny, you know, uh, just to add to that, and coming back to your question is when you walk into a company, how can you tell, right, if, if the leadership is good or not? Right. My mentor, who's also our chief executive, a guy by the name of Mark Haas, in his office for many years, he has uh, a kind of a, you know, a sign, a poster on the wall that's got three words, attitude, reflexed, leadership. And I think, you know, if you, you've got to get recruitment right and everything else. But actually, if you see a consistent attitude um, that perhaps isn't the best in an organization, then really, I think it's down to a leader to first be able to look themselves in the mirror and say, well, have I done everything that I can do? to create the environment and help that person be successful. Um, and, you know, as I create the environment where they've got that great attitude. So I think if you've got people with not a great attitude, you should probably look at the leadership first. Absolutely. And I think another thing to add on to that would be, how do you tell about the leadership in an organization? Well, it's very, very simple. When times are good, everybody's happy, everybody's engaged. But when there's times of crisis or when there's a need for crucial conversations, you can tell a lot about somebody about how they handle conflict how they treat people that either report to them or offer them something within the organization. So we look for how do people react during certain conversations. So sometimes we'll suggest certain topics that we know are going to be hot buttons just to see how certain people react. And the best way that we found to do that is to not pinpoint specific leaders that need additional training. We say, hey, maybe this group could use it. And then we leverage that information to help that single person uh, along their journey a little bit more effectively than others. Oh, something you said there reminds me, of, there was a guy that worked for our company for many years. Um, his name was Ken, and eventually he retired. And he, was, he was pretty introverted. He got his head down, did a great job for the organization. And when he, when he uh, came to retire, he kind of mustered up the courage to stand in front of the whole company and say a few words. And, you know, something that really um, – kind of left a, a resounding uh, kind of message with me was when he said, when there's a problem, don't find somebody to blame, find a way to solve it. And, you know, you're talking about conflict and how people deal with those situations. Um, I know another mantra, I was talking to a, a leader of a construction company last week here in central Florida, something that, that my business shares in is, uh, you know, if something goes wrong, uh, it's my fault. If something goes right, it's down to you. Oh, absolutely. That's that's so relevant to what we're talking about. So um, another thing that we, we encourage is if you're going to praise somebody, do so in public. Um, but if there is something that requires a crucial conversation, there's no need for public interaction. Pull that person aside separately and handle that with discretion. Um, a lot of times ego gets in the way and you want to puff out and, and show people how much authority you have, how how much of a leader you are by publicly criticizing somebody. And what that does is that just deteriorates uh, a culture beyond repair sometimes. Uh, what I like to, several HR manager friends of mine have always communicated to me, hiring somebody is easy. 
replacing that person is the costly part of, of doing business. <laughs> and that goes, speaks to a lot of leadership. So if you want to talk truly about the leadership culture of your, of your organization, look at your turnover, and then really take a deep dive of why that turnover is happening because people generally quit their boss not the organization. Well, I mean, it's interesting that you say that because you, there's some different aspects there. Number one, you don't want to meet pain with pain. And sometimes some organizations have that issue where something goes wrong and it is it's easier to blame Joe and say it's Joe's fault. But then the problem that you run into is that you replace Joe and the same problem continues to occur. So that's some of the things that you have to look at as we move forward. I love really what you said about the backstory there about the guy that retired. I thought right. it was quite, it was quite great. Now, as we move forward here and we have some of this portion of the conversation – the world has changed and things are much different than what they were in 2019. So now we're in 2020. We have a pandemic going on. Have you seen a lot of changes based on the pandemic on how leadership handles things going on inside of organizations? Well, well you know, um, everybody's job role in not just in safety, but beyond has changed somewhat, right? In the last three or four months, either how we, even if not in leadership position, how we carry out our day to day activities, safety professionals have become health and safety professionals. Right. And, and lots of distractions in the, in, the, in the different ways that businesses need to run. Right. And something that in safety 2020, right, we've just come off the back of that Barry Dillard was talking about is always remember that you start with the people that are around you. Hold on. Were you just plugging your own session? Because yes, that's, that's, that's what it sounded like. I just wanted to make Barry sure. Dillard's, but um, <laughs> that was saw straight through that one. <laughs> uh, but it's to bring the people with you, uh, right? And I think, um, I, so I will never forget the day as a, as a girl or a, a lady that worked for me called Stephanie sat in my office one day and she said to me, look, I, I need to give you some feedback. And you could tell she plucked up the courage to give me this feedback. And she said, when I'm in your office and we have our one-to-one meetings that are pre-scheduled, you, you, you're doing other things. Like if the phone rings, you're checking your phone or you're on your computer or, or, or whatever. And I think, um, you know, to me, that was, that was a bit of a wake-up call that you need to be present, right, and be present for your people in the situation that you're in. And so over the, the course of the pandemic, there's been all of these distractions, and I think a challenge for leaders has been to be present for your people, right? Create an environment for them to have a conversation with you about what they're going through. Because it's tough for you, but it's, it's tough for them. And you probably have more information than they do as well. So just take the time to, to be with those people, present with those people, and just, and just let them speak. And I think, I think I've seen great leaders really rise to the top of that, and some other people kind of get a bit bogged down with all of these distractions around the core, which is taking care of your people. Oh, absolutely. And two things you said there were just amazing. So you talk about being present. That's always been, you know, a key issue with employees and employers and, and, and lead, people in leadership roles. But the communication aspect of it has changed greatly. You know, we're now communicating instead of face to face. Great leaders are having to find creative ways to engage their employees. And you can tell when they're, they're able to do that. When you're able to engage an employee in today's, you know, the, the state of affairs that we're in today, it takes a lot more work. Um, but leaders now are not only expected to be knowledgeable, they're not only expected to be true leaders and engaging, but they're supposed to provide empathy. Um, this is a new skill for a lot of leaders. A lot of leaders now have to think about other things. Um, I remember Google said it so well when this first started. They said, yeah, our, our employees can work from home. Our employees can do all these things remotely but they still crave that interaction. And so Google, while they lead the charge in, in trying to help and communicate and find better ways and more creative ways to manage employees, they've also realized that people need that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So as you mentioned that I have a quick question, as you've noticed this change because of the pandemic and these great leaders that were doing X before, do you think that there's more distractions that are caused now when they're interacting with their quote unquote team members, employees or so on, on oh. when they're trying to have that discussion? Because now it's not the in-person. So you don't see if they have a nervous twitch. You don't see if something has changed. Now, all of a sudden you're looking at a Zoom call and it could be a couple of different things. It could be an actual live video feed or it could be a picture. So how do you look at that? Well, so it's, it's interesting. Do you mind if I go here? No. Or I, I feel like I just keep talking. And we almost tell <laughs> oh, I'm, that was, I'm that enjoying amazing. your uh, southern accent, Josh. It's very nice. <laughs> so um, when, when you're dealing with people remotely and you're dealing with remote workers, there's an opportunity to engage those workers. Um, but you also pick up on certain things that are things that you may not have noticed before. You're finding out a lot more details about that person. 
Um, we talked about this earlier today, and it's it's really quite interesting. When the pandemic first hit, everybody's on Zoom, everybody's on these Microsoft team calls, and everybody's video box is open, <laughs> and everybody's totally transparent. And there's lots of funny videos that are that are happening online about you know the results of a Zoom call that went horribly wrong or whatever. <laughs> um, but now, as you notice, um, there's data that shows that people are turning off their cameras, which means two things: they're either becoming disengaged with the process, or they are, are finding it hard to be transparent because when you're working remotely, the expectation is, hey, I am super um, transparent. Everybody needs to know what I'm doing all the time. Now, when I started this company um, back in 2018, I found that because I wasn't driving as much as I was before, I was so much more efficient. And there's a lot of employees out there that are scared to death because they're becoming super efficient and they're getting a lot more done without more being put on their plate. And so there's a lot of layoffs and a lot of talks uh, about cutbacks. And so people are really nervous about how to handle that. Can I be too productive in today's society? Mm -hmm. I think just as well, just to kind of add to that, you know, you, you talked about um, the engagement with people. You know, Jay just kind of alluded to the interpersonal part of a face to face uh, meeting, uh, um, which is obviously a huge challenge, right? And say virtually, and there's a couple of things, I guess. One is is to think about. Um, does it need to be a group meeting? And, and if it does, is there also a one-to-one -one that needs to happen, right? Because people are more likely to open up. Maybe you can, you, you, hopefully you've got a good enough relationship, right? You're a leader to say to your guy, hey, man, turn your camera on, will you? It's all right. It can't be that bad. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Although you do need a haircut, Josh. I, I do. Uh, I agree. Um, but, but I think there's another leadership principle here, certainly something that I've learned in my time as I've been very lucky to, to be given the opportunity of the career that I, I have with SG World. And that's to treat everybody different, to treat them the same, right? Not everybody is the same, or situational leadership, kind of, I call it. And you said, you know, the first thing to do is, is listen to people, right? You've got two ears and one mouth. Yeah. Let's try and use them in that proportion, right? And try and figure out what is their mindset and what is their attitude, right, now, on the specific subject you're talking to them about. And, and they say, you know, they, I hate to, but they gauge their readiness. Let me give you an example. If Josh um, decided um, that he was going to break the toilet at work, <laughs> let's say, and uh, and someone said, "Oh, no Josh specifics, is," no I was like, "Well, how did this happen?" This is, this this is it's, a, it's a hypothetical example. <laughs> this did not happen, but we might need to leave here pretty soon. Um, <laughs> that he was going to break the toilet at work, and it came to my attention that Josh had broke the toilet, um, and Josh did not care about that. He came to my face. He didn't care. He blamed everybody else, and he was not remorseful in, in the least. And it was the toilet's fault. And everything else then my approach to managing that if you like with josh might have to be a little bit more directive right i might need to think about okay well let's just take a step back and just understand why damaging the toilet is an issue and and then and then be a bit more direct and let him know that you you know you you can't do what you did in in the toilet right but, but, but if, but if, in the toilet or to the toilet <laughs> it's subjective um, whereas you know if josh has come into our oh, came to me no one told me. It was Josh who came to me and said, oh, Rich, I've just, you're not going to believe what I've just done to the toilet. I'm, I'm just, I'm so, so, I'm so sorry. You haven't even had lunch yet. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> how did we get to the toilet? I know that we were big on porta potties yeah, at one there point. There we are. <laughs> but, and he's very remorseful about it. And he's beating himself up and he genuinely is just, you know, distraught that he's, that he's, he's broken some property then the leadership approach is going to be supportive, right? You're going to say, okay, well, let's just go and find out. Don't worry about it. You're going to help him through. You're probably not going to take money out of his paycheck, right? It's the same outcome that the, the person takes responsibility to what, for what they've done and, and they've kind of taken a lesson from that. But because of their attitude, um, you treat everybody different to treat them the same. Absolutely. So, I, just, I just have to say some of the verbiage that you use about being inside of that bathroom, I don't even know if we can actually air that in most places. I just want to bring that up just in case. <laughs> we may have to, we may have to do a little cut in there. Maybe, maybe well, the, I, the I don't even know if we would add that real quick. Maybe the R-rated safety show. But let's talk about some other things because I think that it's something that you mentioned, but you didn't say it directly. Do you think we're missing the golden rule? So uh, let me, do you mind if I go? Yeah, please do. Here we go. <laughs> Apparently you're going first every time, uh, so go right Apparently, if I don't go first, I'm in the bathroom. <laughs> so I've got to figure that out. I know, out. that was the first story. Imagine <laughs> what he has next. So uh, one of my mentors, Jerry Shoup, who, who is the corporate director of uh, Hensel Phelps Construction, is, is an amazing leader, tremendous leader. And one of the things that he communicated to me is that when you're dealing with employees, when you're trying to mentor, coach, and correct, um, and grow people, there needs to be continuous communication. 
And what he meant by that is if you do a, um, a yearly review with an employee, and if that's the first time you're having that conversation with that employee, you have failed as a leader. Um, when you do a yearly review with an employee, they should know exactly what you're going to say. They should know exactly what the game plan is well beyond that. If you're surprising them with information, you have failed as a leader. And, and, it, and it struck me. I'm like, okay, well, what does that mean? And that means that you have to be present. You have to take advantage of the little moments that you have with everybody that you interact with, whether they report to you or not. People can tell when you're present. And so when you talk about the communication, you talk about, okay, how do I engage somebody? That's what I think about. I think about, okay, everybody needs to know exactly how I feel. And right, wrong, or indifferent, it's my opportunity as a leader to communicate that in a very positive manner that can create growth with that employee. Okay, but going back for a second, you kind of avoided the question, too, so I like how you kind of did that. But what do you think about the golden rule? Do you think that it's actually missing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, in today's society, um, we're very quick to judge. Um, Do it all the time. We tend (laughs) tend to not put ourselves in other people's shoes, and we tend not to look at it from their perspective. Um, Usually, and sometimes we're doing this right now, we may be doing this currently, instead of listening to what other people are saying, we're planning our response. Absolutely. So when I'm engaging somebody, if I want them to be treated like I want to be treated, I would say, please listen to what I have to say absorb it, and then formulate your response. You can tell a lot about a person when, they're, when they start talking and they're, they try to talk over you before you've finished your point, which means that they're not listening. And that's something that transcends all occupations. Welcome to radio. <laughs> if I can just, I just want to come back to the communication piece, um, if you like, just from my own, lear- yeah. my own learning. Uh, early on in my management career, um, I was actually banned from sending emails for a short time. Uh, and it kind of comes back to this notion of situational leadership, right? Yes, the performance review should just be a recap, right? Stuff we already know. Uh, but actually, it's about thinking about what to communicate, when and how. If every is umbrella management, right? If, if every time someone does something small, you're on at them, that's not leadership. You're not going to get them engaged, right? You just want to think about, okay, well, do I need to address that right now? Um, or maybe you hang on to it and you start to realize what's really going on. And then later you'll have a conversation about the overall uh, picture, right? Uh, and the other thing is don't send an email if it's better to have a conversation. If a guy phones you um, with an issue and it's a big issue, maybe don't address it on that phone call. Maybe say, what are you doing later? Let's sit down and have a cup of coffee. So I think the key to communication is, is also thinking about what you want to communicate, when you're going to do it, and, and, and how you do it as well. Absolutely. And how about allowing employees to systematically fail? Um, as you try to grow employees and, and try to mentor and coach people around you, um, far too often as leaders, we want to protect them at every corner, every turn. We never want to see them fall and, and have to get up and dust themselves off. Some of the best le- lessons I've ever learned as a leader are where I have failed. Um, and there's a difference between a crucial failure and a learning failure. Right. Um, and I think that that's important for a leader. You never want somebody to go down the path where they are going to fail and cost them their career right. or be detrimental. Or, or, the biz- or have a, a big impact on the business, right? Exactly. But you want them to be able to fail to, to, yeah. to get a learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. But the emails thing, too. One thing that I learned, um, and I got some great feedback from some tremendous employees, um, I would always take my work home. I was kind of an overworker, and here I am sending out emails 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. Your cadence for emails and communication tells you uh, tells your employees a lot about how you stand as a leader. If you're sending emails that expect a response and you're sending them at 10 o'clock at night, that's communicating to your employees that I really don't care about your work-life balance. Mm. I'm interested in my objective first, and so your life position comes second. What's the message you're sending as well as what are the words that you're saying, Absolutely. right? And just briefly to flip on your head about allow people to fail, right? In order to, in, in order to do that, you have to create an environment for them to work in, right? And you might just find that they won't fail. In fact, they might thrive and be more successful at something than even you can be. And I think that's a trait of a successful leader, Absolutely. right? Well, Somebody who is not scared of the person that works than me and you want those people to be better at their job than you are. And there are too many managers, if you like, who try and push those people into the box because they're scared for their own selves. When, when really you should stand behind the organization and, and, and create an environment where those people can thrive 
and be better than you. So, so in other words, what you're saying then is you're looking to set up an environment where people can fail safely, yep, where there's absolutely. a safeguard where they fall into that. Now, you did mention something, Josh, if you don't mind me going back for a moment, where you said work-life balance. Now, with this new world that we're in, of course, Zoom's readily available, Teams is readily available, Skype, so on, this easy format of a communication. Do you... And it's a feelings question, so let's kind of be very careful here. Yeah. Do you feel that as leaders, we're giving our people enough opportunity to have a work-life balance because they are working now from home for the most part? I don't think so. I think there's there's two different um, trains of thought here. First of all, there's a huge difference between a leader and a boss, right? So I want to cover that first and, and say that, you know, a leader is somebody that encourages all those around them to grow and in many cases, pass them by with their abilities. That's that's a sign of a true leader when the people that report to you, that you mentor and coach, just surpass you and you get to watch them do great things. A boss will put people into a box and say, this is how you're going to behave. This is how you're going to do things and you're going to do it my way or you're out. You talk about work-life balance. Um, a boss would expect somebody to be available, uh, to call them on a Teams call at 10 o'clock at night and ruin their their work-life balance. Things are important. We're missing things um, in life because of work. So you can only miss so many soccer games. You can only miss so many things with your wife or spouse. You can only miss so many things before all those things deteriorate around you. And that's why work-life balance is so important because people that are not happy away from work are generally not happy at work. So we should encourage people to have a workload and a span of control that allows them to have just as much flexibility at home as it, as at work. And that, you know, th this work-life balance is something that has been coined for generations, right, in, in management and leadership. It's always on the performance review. How is your work-life balance, right? But in today's environment, surely that's a real challenge, right? There's a big piece in leadership which is about trust, yeah, we talk about trust all the time in leadership. You want them to buy in and trust you, but that kind of goes both, both ways. And that's a difficult one, particularly what Jay's saying with these remote workers as well. Do you want to manage someone to from nine till five? That's work. And then from five till nine is life. Is, is that reality? Or maybe there's a soccer game, football. For the benefit. Yeah, I was going to say, what are, you, what are you talking about? Here? Yeah, maybe there's a maybe there's a football match at three thirty that my son's playing. Not an NFL. Not an NFL. On the pitch, non, non NFL, <laughs> on the pitch right. and there's a queue to get and in. And there's the a stadium. queue to get in. Thank you very much. And it costs. Five, I'm precious to that. Costs idea. five pounds to get in. Yeah. Uh, but you know, do I want to, on the flip side, say to my my guy, yeah, well, you can't go because it's at three thirty, or do I manage outcomes? Do I try and create an environment for somebody and say, hey, jo you've been doing a great job. And, and, you know, I'm wanting to take ownership of what he's doing. You've been doing a great job. We've got this really important project. It needs to be in by next Friday. You're the guy. How would you feel? Would you like to do it? Oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Do I now manage him from nine till five? And, and mean, he, 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 he you know, misses his, his kid's football match, and so he's not as happy as you say. Or do I manage to the outcome um, and let him kind of be flexible with the hours that he does it in as long as he delivers? But that's difficult because... Leaders are, I am, skeptical, right? Yeah. You're always worried that people might just take the life bit a little bit too far. Um, and so how do you get the balance between having the appropriate control measures in place but trusting your people to deliver outside of nine to five? Absolutely. Do, do you think that that's common, though? Do you think that most people go outcome-based opposed to, let's say, quote-unquote, hourly-based, even though they're a salary person? I think it's moving that way. I think when you look, you know, that's pioneered by technology companies and these forward-thinking organizations that get rid of offices. It's all open plan, and there are, you know, s slides that you can go down and nap pods and all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> so, and, and I, th I think what happens is, is, is it's kind of the layers of an onion, right? You've got the outer layer of these businesses that are kind of early adopters and pioneer the way and then slowly it becomes normal um, and it becomes more of an expectation and so as you get to the, the you know you work your way through the like these companies in the inner layers are kind of forced to try and find a way to change so they can attract the best talent because that starts to become something that people are looking for absolutely and i think one one interesting point of that is you can actually measure this, and it's fairly easy to measure. If you go into an organization, you start doing surveys. Um, one question that we ask is, how often do you, does your boss talk about challenges at home? Um, how often do you talk to your boss about challenges at home? 
Um, and you can tell there, there is a definite shift. There is an old school way of thinking that, you know, you shall work however many hours it takes to satisfy the company's needs. And there's a new way of thinking that says, you know, let's measure the outcomes. Let's manage to the outcomes. And if people are performing, heck yeah, they deserve to have a little bit extra time at home. And specifically, the way I measure it, when somebody is home, are they truly home and present? Mm. Or are they always watching their emails? Are they always watching their texts because they're worried that their boss is going to text them and, and have another crucial, super important thing that they need to talk about at 9 o'clock when you're trying to talk to your kid, for instance, me just being totally transparent. Um, I used to be that worker. I used to be that person that tried to satisfy the company because I I thought if I could climb that corporate ladder, I would one day be happy. And what I ended up doing is I sacrificed so many years with my son, years that I will never get back years that I was never present for a job that I was a ghost when I left two weeks later. I'm going to tell you, he might use this, this audio clip as, against you at some does. point. I just want but to bring I'm that transparent up. With him. <laughs> I him. But I'm transparent with him. I tell him, I'm what? like, hey, buddy, when, I was, when you were younger, I was not present, and I need you to hold me accountable. So leaders, not only just at work, but it's at home too. Are you communicating the right message at home? Is there a plan for work-life balance? So, because, so let's go a little bit deeper because you, you're using the word transparent if you're okay with it. Absolutely. What did your wife think during this time frame? You know, uh, it, it's kind of the old school thinking. Um, unfortunately, I had been a part of some organizations that were very old school in thought, and so that was normal. She had seen that her whole life, so she thought that was normal. So we had to kind of bla- break through that barrier together and say, this is not where we want to be. And to be perfectly honest, to to kind of break that mold and start something brand new, I took a very successful career and said, I'm done with that. And I moved to Guam with my family. Um, and so when you live on an island that is eight miles wide by 24 miles long, you are forced to get to know your family. You're forced to, <laughs> to be there. And so my my kid, my son, who is who's actually my hero, um, who I was I had a distant relationship with, very quickly became my shadow. Um, He's 14. He was five at the time. We still talk about Guam daily, if not, you know, definitely weekly, but we talk about it all the time and about how my whole perspective changed. So when we left Guam, when I started interviewing with companies, it was much less about the title and the role and the compensation. And it was more about how do you treat our families? How, how are you expecting me to behave within this organization? Oh, that, that's very so, neat. That's very neat. I, I would imagine that had to be such a unique experience there. How long were you there, if you don't mind me asking? 18 months. 18 was, months. pretty awesome. Okay. Yeah. So a couple questions real quick. If you could tell people that there is a book that you read that changed your style of leadership, what would you say the book is? And we're going to start off with Rich this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think um, – you know, I was fortunate to do a lot of studying with my MBA and, and I had a very, a, a very much a focus on leadership. Right. Uh, but I think it's the thing that I mentioned earlier. It's a Hershey and Blanchard situational leadership. Mm-hmm. I think that really does bring into focus, treat everybody different to treat them the same. And so I would say if you're going to read something, read that. So three, three books, just because I, well, I said when you go with three, so, oh, but, but here's my actually, Amazon link. Here I we go. Translate <laughs> but it's actually, one. it's actually tremendous because they, they all work in tandem. Um, and I, I love that book. Amazing. In fact, I, I like to do a lot of work with Blanchard. I think that they have great, um, I was leadership. actually on your laptop earlier and I noticed among <laughs> oh some, of the, the, some of the, uh, the links, one of them was, you know, professional and it was. Oh, she's awesome. So um, what I like is uh, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Um, Great book because it teaches you that, you know, you have all these habits built into who you are and you can't get rid of them. All you can do is replace them. And I thought, wow, that's very poignant. That's that's an interesting way to look at things. Uh, The next one, Jim Collins from Good to Great. Um, And that's where it talks about leaving the ego at the door. Egos never lead to continued excellence. And then Simon Sinek, start with why. And I know that's mm-hmm. cliche and he's, he's so out there. Um, he's, he's everywhere now, but there's a reason for that. But there's a reason for that because he is all about why are you doing this? So if you look at your employee, if you're my employee, I have to, as a leader say, why is rich here? Why does he want to be a part of this organization? And why does it even matter? 
So mm. those are my three. Sorry. For oh, me. you know, it's, it's all good. Well, I appreciate the time this afternoon, especially going over all of this information. Now, Josh, if more people want to know about you and the organization that you're, you're fronting, where can they go to find out more? Absolutely. You can go to ignitethejourney.com. That's our website. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn. I am on the Facebook. I am on the, <laughs> on the Facebook. Yeah. Facebook. <laughs> that that just are. speaks to my age. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, we'd love to hear from you. I'd love to talk to you more about how we might be able to support your organization. And Rich, how about yourself? Yeah, I think for us, uh, you know, if you'd like to learn more about kind of the, the safety and security related products that, that we supply to help you make a difference, you can visit sgworldusa.com for the US and for internationally, sgworld.com. And then if you want to partake in the event that they have coming up in 2021, it will be Safety Day 2021. You can go to acfs.org for more information. Gentlemen, I appreciate the time this afternoon. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you. you, Jay. Well, this brings another episode of the Jay Allen Show to an end. Hopefully you enjoyed the conversation with Joshua Caudell and Richard Nichols. Like I said earlier, for more information about what they have going on, you can go to acfs.org. All kinds of interesting things on that particular website. Anyways, thank you for always being the best part of Safety FM, and that is the listener. Safety FM is the home of Real Safety Talk. If you want to come out, hang out with us, do some different things, you can come to the website at safetyfm.com. We are always streaming 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right there on safetyfm.com, you can also gather the different apps on where we're available to stream. And keep in mind, like always, it's for free. Don't worry, we'll be back with another episode before too long. Goodbye for now. Want more of The Jay Allen Show? Go to safetyfm.com. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.